Howdy my friends and welcome to the channel. I'm Luke, Thunderhead 2D9 here on YouTube. And in this video here today, we're gonna talk about free horsepower. Now I know that's a buzzword that a lot of people will drop. It's pretty clickbaity, but you know, there, this is no marketing gimmick. There's no smoke and mirrors, no tricks. This is the power potential that your engine has always had in it, but you've probably just never utilized it. Time and time again, I see people put a bunch of money into engine builds and then never use it to its fullest potential. So today we're gonna review, you know, how to better do that. And with probably an hour's worth of wrenching, you know, have a lot more torque out of your engine and just a lot more performance in general. So with that, let's jump right in. Now, since everyone's gonna say, why don't you ever do a pull in the truck? I guess we'll do one today. Try and roll in the first easy. Now, as absolutely cliche as it may be, the old adage is true. Timing is everything, and that's extremely applicable with these old school carbureted style engines. Now, like I said, oftentimes I see people just build a really stout engine and then leave gobs of power on the table, and it's usually due to inadequacies in their ignition timing. Now, an engine is really nothing more but a giant air pump. As the piston goes down, air rushes in to fill the void. All around us is atmospheric pressure, which at sea level is about 14 and a half PSI or so, and that's just trying to cram its way into the cylinder as the piston goes down. Now, vacuum, like a vacuum gauge you would have on an engine, you can think of in a simplified way as a resistance to this flow. So just to demonstrate here, if we cover our port, as you see, as the piston goes down, our vacuum gauge reading is actually going up. So what regulates the inflow of air on your engine is of course the throttle blades of your carburetor. The less throttle that you have for a specific RPM, the higher your vacuum rating is of course gonna be. Now again, just to demonstrate this relationship, we're going down the road about 1500 RPM in fourth gear here. It's taking some throttle input to keep us going down the road. Now if I let go of the gas pedal here, our throttle blades on our carburetor are gonna to return to their idle position. And you'll see that now that since we have a higher RPM, that manifold vacuum is gonna be much higher. And there you see it, it went up a little bit. Do it one more time, release, and there you go. So as you saw there, the concept is pretty simple. The carburetor throttle blades are what regulate the inflow of air to the engine. Now it's not rocket science to understand that the more you open the throttle on a carburetor, the more fuel that you are effectively using. So for a set RPM, the higher the vacuum rating that you can achieve, the more efficient your engine is going to run and the less fuel that you're effectively using. The more effectively you are using that cylinder charge and the less you open your throttle blades, the less cylinder fill that you have. So Really quick, let's jump out and we'll just demonstrate this at idle. We'll manipulate some things and see how the engine responds. All right, so this is gonna be our baseline here. We got our engine up to temp and idling. Our air fuel ratio is about 14 or so. Manifold vacuum hanging out at about 20 inches of mercury there. And we're idling at about 700 RPM. Now our initial mechanical timing is eight degrees. What we're gonna do is just jump out there and retard it to six degrees and then note the changes on all of our readouts. So let's jump under the hood and do that quick. All right, so looking pretty good there. We're at about six degrees instead of eight degrees. And now we'll get a look at all of our readings here. All right, so we've dropped a little RPM, as you can see, down to about 600. So two degrees, we lost about, you know, 100 RPM or so. Now, in dropping RPM, we altered the relationship with our carburetor, so we can see now that it's way leaner. And even though this is a pretty dang stock cam, so um, it's pretty accommodating to changes, we still did lose vacuum. We were up just slightly above 20, and now we're down at 18 or 19. So just by changing the timing on the engine, 
we can see that it's not as efficient and to be able to get back to the same rpm with this ignition timing setting what we'd have to do is turn the curb idle screw on our carburetor and adjust our mix screws again all right so as you see there's obviously a notable relationship between ignition timing and the dynamics of an engine now what's actually going on here you know what's what's happening with this relationship and this is why ignition timing is so important you know it's no surprise that there's obviously an optimal time to ignite that mixture in the combustion chamber in the cylinder stroke. Anything before or after that, you're just leaving power on the table. And this isn't about timing advance. You know, more advance doesn't mean more power. If you're too early, you're leaving the same amount of power on the table as you are if you're too late. And you can even cause engine damage. So again, you know, we're trying to get to this optimal point in the cylinder stroke to burn this mixture because we're gonna make peak power out of that specific cylinder charge volume. And again, people are always blaming carburetors for shortcomings in their ignition timing, blaming them for their performance issues or whatever. Now carburetors are actually extremely forgiving and from the factory for a street built engine, they're usually pretty dang close to correct. So, you know, we need to pay some respect to our ignition timing so let's take a look at our ignition timing advance and see how all that plays in here. Like, I mean, look at this cute little guy. How could you even be mad at this thing? It's perfect. So looking at ignition timing advance and how that's handled by our distributor, you need to increase ignition timing as RPM increases. For a set cylinder charge, it has relatively the same burn time. So to still get it to fully ignite, Fully ignite that cylinder charge at the right place in the cylinder stroke, you need to fire that mixture earlier and earlier and earlier. Now a distributor adds timing for several different scenarios. Vacuum Advance handles one of those scenarios which we've already reviewed in a previous video. But as it relates to RPM, a distributor under the cap and rotor here has a set of centrifugal weights that as RPM increases, the force on these weights do also which pulls them out and it will actually rotate your distributor and advance your ignition timing if you've ever been in like the silly silo you know that centrifugal force holding you against the wall that's the same force acting on these weights now what controls the rate of timing advance the rpm needed to throw these weights out is these springs now a heavier spring will obviously have more resistance so it takes more rotational speed for these weights to be able to fling out so more rpm is needed for that timing advance to come in on the other hand of course lighter springs it takes less force to overcome those so your timing comes in at a lot quicker rate most stock distributors and even aftermarket distributors right out of the box will have very heavy advanced springs which is super safe but once your vacuum advance drops out you're just on your mechanical initial timing. Remember, there's a relationship between the throttle blades and our vacuum. When you step on the throttle hard, your vacuum drops out entirely. You're just on your mechanical advance, and oftentimes in these stock, unaltered scenarios, um, it's just extremely late. You're firing that charge somewhere down the stroke. Again, it's extremely, extremely safe. But your engine has a lot more potential in it, and if we can tailor this ignition curve to the engine specifically, then, you know, there's a lot more power to be had. So all this makes sense, right? You know, just put the lightest springs in that you possibly can, bring your timing all in by 2000 RPM, and you're golden, you're making a ton of power. Wrong, this is one of the biggest things that I see on the internet that really stresses me out. Like I said earlier in the video, too early of ignition timing is just as detrimental as too late of ignition timing. It's not about timing advance, it's about firing that cylinder charge at the right point in the cylinder stroke. You have to find the balance that satisfies all driving conditions for your specific vehicle. Now remember if, if you're in a street car you should be running vacuum advance and as you're cruising around you're also adding in vacuum advance ignition timing. So you know if you have too much timing in all of this you can have part throttle detonation and some other stuff that you really don't want to have happen. So you need to look at this all as a full package. And you know, there's differences in different vehicles. Obviously a heavy truck like this F100 with a small 302 is gonna have a different timing curve setup, different ignition timing requirements 
then you know a little Nova with a big old 454 under the hood. So those are all things that you need to consider. And I do love the old school mechanical nature of these distributors, but at the same time there are inherent drawbacks where you know you have to make some compromises across the board so that again all of this is able to handle all the driving scenarios that the vehicle is presented with. Now determining this balance for your timing curve is best done on a dyno. But since we all don't have access to that, you know, a crude method that I use is to find a specific stretch of road and you need to keep reviewing on this road because conditions are relatively the same and you need to work your throttle through different throttle positions all the way from cruising, part throttle acceleration, and hard acceleration. And what you're looking for is having the highest vacuum when you're cruising and then when you're in the throttle hard you don't want to have any bucking or pinging. So again, this is extremely crude, but if you don't have access to anything else, you know, you can get maybe not perfect, but pretty darn close. Now what really works well for this truck is to have it in fourth gear here. And anything that does well at a high load is gonna be just fine at a lighter load. So I usually go for about fourth. And then basically I'll run it through some different scenarios. So cruising, we're making good vacuum, you know, that's good vacuum advance and all that is working well together but also i want to load the engine more than i ever would and as long as it's not bucking or pinging at me you know everything seems to be okay with our timing curve and you want to do this at several different rpm points you know in this gear for me for in fourth gear and again you want to use the same stretch of road so all the conditions are exactly the same so for me with this big heavy truck the two middle springs which are, you know, not the lightest, but not the heaviest. Both of those worked out the best. Now you can use combinations of the springs to tailor your timing curve, of course, but I've seen the best results out of setting this truck up with a 302 and a five speed and this long bed F100 that way. Now, although very crude, varying your engine load at different RPM ranges, like 1500, 2000, 2500, and 3000 RPM in a tall gear, and monitoring how your engine responds to that does give you a very good window overall into what your engine wants for ignition timing. Now the tall gear is important because it's our limiter because whatever works for it will work for the gears below it also. So for me, whatever works for fourth is gonna work for first, second, and third without having any issues. Now you make the most power by firing your mixture at the right time. This isn't about more timing, this is about correct timing. When you step on the throttle, you fall back to just your mechanical timing, which is controlled by your springs, which are entirely RPM based. But you have to review your timing for all scenarios. And that's why varying your throttle at different RPM is extremely important. Remember, at light load and cruising, you're also adding timing with your vacuum advance canister. So there's a lot of things that play into all this. Now the takeaway here is that most all mechanical ignition timing curves are extremely lazy and conservative. Taking a lot of RPM to pull in any ignition timing at all and leaving a lot of power on the table when you're at hard throttle, which is where you want it. With a little bit of tuning, you'll immediately notice how much harder your engine accelerates. And this is definitely something worth looking into. So that's gonna do it for me today, guys. I hope you all learned something. And remember, you're only as good as your tuning tools. So I highly recommend picking up a timing light. I'll leave the link to the one that I use below. I don't care which one you have, but you do need to get one. Timing is not something worth guessing on. So with that, I'll see you guys for the next one. We'll catch you later.